Okay, good morning and thank you all for coming this morning. Um, we're going to talk about geriatric trauma. This doesn't sound as exciting as maybe gunshot wound to the abdomen or perforated intestine or liver injury, but this is a very, very important topic, something we're seeing more and more of, and something that we all need to uh, kind of take a refresher course in, me included. Um, so uh, just a little bit of background, baby boomers were born after World War II. Uh, between 46 and 64, baby boomers reached the age of 65 just a few years ago in 2011, okay? And the population is increasing every year. Um, by the year 2050, which sounds like a long time away, but it'll be here fairly soon, uh, the elderly, and when I say elderly for the purpose of this lecture, 65 or older. Some say 70 or older. That's, anybody who is in that age group shouldn't feel bad when somebody says elderly 65. That's just how the American College of Surgeons Tra Committee on Trauma classifies the elderly. So 65 and older. 22% uh, of the population will be 65 and older and currently the elderly are occupying and consuming about one-third of our health care dollars and that's only going to increase. Causes of death Trauma is number seven in the elderly. In a younger person, it's much higher. Uh, as you can see, a lot of these diseases will uh, cause death in the elderly, but, but trauma is, is definitely up there. So we're going to start with a case scenario. We have a 79-year-old male who was transported to Freeman Emergency Room. He's placed in the green pod, and he was found at the base of the stairs by his wife. And these are his vital signs. Heart rate is 64, blood pressure 110 over 60. Respiratory rate is high, 30, and his Glasgow Coma Scale is 12. And for those of you who don't know, 15 is normal, 12 is, you know, suggests a possible head injury. So when we look at this, what are we, what are we concerned about right off the bat? Um, respiratory rate's high, so he could have a chest injury, could have a pneumothorax, hemothorax. Uh, Glasgow Coma Scale is, is a little bit diminished, so he could have a traumatic brain injury. What about his vital signs? Does anybody think this patient's in shock? They look pretty normal, right? So this particular patient, you take his history, he has a history of atrial fibrillation, hypertension, diabetes. He's on atenolol, which is a beta blocker, <clears throat> Xeralto, which is a blood thinner, and metformin. On exam, his airway is patent, his lungs are clear, his abdomen is non-tender. His neurologic exam, he's somewhat sleepy and confused, and he opens his eyes to voice command and follows basic commands. And uh, his extremity exam, he's tender over his left hip. So his vital signs initially look okay, so we feel that we can send him to the radiology department for some imaging. On chest x-ray, you can see that he has some right rib fractures over here. Is my arrow showing up? Good. Right rib fractures and possibly a pulmonary contusion. See this bruise underneath here? There's no evidence of a pneumothorax. There's no hemothorax. His mediastinum which is right here. This is a aorta and vena cava that does not look widened. So it doesn't look like he has any immediate life-threatening injuries. Rib fractures and a small pulmonary contusion. <coughs> Pelvis x-ray, he's got a left hip fracture. His femoral neck is fractured. This is a very common injury in the elderly. What will we do for this immediately? Probably not much other than maybe splint his leg. Does this cause life-threatening hemorrhage, a hip fracture? Usually not. So chest x-ray, there's nothing we need to do immediately, like a chest tube or a decompression of his chest. And for this injury, nothing specific yet so far. CT of his brain, does anybody know what this is? It says it on there. It's a hint. Subdural hematoma is very, very common in the elderly. They can get a subdural hematoma with a minimal mechanism, falling down the steps, falling from standing. Uh, subdural hematoma is, is almost always tearing of the veins, uh, uh, subdural veins around the brain. And you can see with this particular patient, it's a pretty classic CT scan. They have a concave uh, hematoma, and this particular patient has midline shift. This is the midline. It should be straight up and down in the middle. You can see that the ventricles are pushed to the side. And this is a severe life-threatening injury. This patient will herniate if they don't get decompressed. What in his history can make this worse? Right, he's on Xeralto, he's on a blood thinner. So these patients can bleed significantly. And since he's in the CT scanner, we you know, scan pretty much everything anymore. Um, 
This particular patient had a benign abdominal exam, but he got a CT scan of his abdomen and it shows a spleen injury. You can see a, a crack in the spleen right here. So, right now we have to get into our head what are the priorities uh, for this particular patient. Is it his head injury? Is it his chest? Is it his abdomen? Does he need to go for a laparotomy? Does he need to go for a craniotomy? Is he in shock? So I want you to think about these things as we go through the lecture and then we're going to address this again at the end. So this particular patient who fell, again, um, most people when they think of somebody falling down, you know, when, when you have a little kid who falls down, you, you pick him up, you dust him off, you know, pat him on the bottom and then go back and play. When an elderly patient falls, it can be life-threatening. Falls are the number one cause of trauma in the elderly um, and there are many factors that go into it, poor vision, impaired balance, decreased reflexes, uh, poor peripheral vision. Uh, so this is, the, this is the thing we're dealing with the most. The second most common cause of trauma is uh, motor vehicle accidents. Motor vehicle accidents, catch the dog's eyes. All right. <laughs> it's a service dog, yeah. He's watching the road for her. So, Motor vehicle accidents in the elderly happen usually during the day, usually during good weather and close to their neighborhood. It's not uh, rainy, it's not in the middle of the night, they're, they're usually not intoxicated like a younger population that we treat. They get into car accidents for several reasons, uh, impaired vision, uh, they cannot check their blind spot maybe as well as a younger person because they could have cervical stenosis or, or uh, you know, carotid disease and, and, and arthritis and they just can't see their blind spot and their peripheral vision is definitely decreased. Their reflexes are not as good as a younger person, so motor vehicle accidents are, are a significant mechanism of injury. Also, auto pedestrian accidents uh, are a significant uh, cause of morbidity and mortality in an elderly person. And the third most common cause uh, of injury, trauma in an elderly patient are burns and uh, they're most commonly associated with smoking, uh, smoking in bed, leaving a cigarette somewhere that catches fire. Uh, many times it is uh, something left on the stove that is unattended to or ignored and elderly patients, especially in the winter, are very fond of space heaters, so we get a lot of space heater fires. Uh, burn patient, uh, trauma, uh, uh, traumatic burn in an elderly patient is devastating. They usually uh, have a very poor outcome. Any patient who has a less, uh, or excuse me, a 5% body surface area or more burn should go to a burn center. So how do we determine what 5% is? Uh, you, for, the, for the patient themselves, the size of their hand is 1%. So if they have five of their hand, of their, of their entire hand burned on their body, second degree or more, they have to go to a burn center because they really do very, very poorly. So this is a very busy slide. It's from the uh, ATLS book, and it's supposed to be a busy slide. This is to remember us of all of the changes that occur when someone ages. And we're gonna, we're gonna go over a lot of these individually. Um, decreased brain mass, uh, impaired vision, um, impaired renal function, impaired respiratory function, impaired blood flow to their extremities, uh, osteoporosis, peripheral neuropathy, they may have had a stroke, impaired hearing, um, their, their cardiac stroke volume and rate is definitely impaired. Kidney disease, um, decreased elasticity of skin, thinning of the epidermis, and decrease in body fat, which sounds great to some people, but for an elderly person it can be a devastating uh, problem if they have an injury. So we're gonna go through some of these uh, important systems and, and see how someone ages. 50% of the people over 65 have coronary artery disease. <clears throat> you just have to assume that. You don't know, you may not, they may, ha may or may not have a history of it, but you just have to assume that every other person you see in the ER over 65 has got significant coronary artery disease. As you age, the myocardium stiffens. They have slowed electrophysiologic conduction, which predisposes to arrhythmias. Uh, they have an impaired response to catecholamines, and this is very important. When we're in an accident, flight or fight response, Catecholamines surge through our, our vascular system, and in a normal healthy person, we respond with tachycardia and increased cardiac output, which helps us make it through the trauma, helps us sustain our blood pressure, helps us perfuse our brain and our kidneys. An elderly pace, patient, they do not respond well to catecholamine surge, and so they do not have the usual tachycardia, increased cardiac output. 
Um, elderly patients do, however, respond with increased afterload, and that is ma manifested by an increased systolic blood pressure. Um, so this is a very important point. We're going to talk about this again in a few slides later, but uh, that's one of the main take-home points as far as assessing somebody's vital signs and exam in a trauma. So all of these things together have decreased stroke volume and cardiac output overall in a trauma patient. So again, instead of responding to catecholamines with increased heart rate and increased cardiac output, elderly patients respond with an increase in blood pressure. Now this can give you a, a nice warm feeling when you, say one, when you see 120 over 80 on an elderly person. This patient could be in shock. So you cannot be, you cannot be reassured with a normal blood pressure in an elderly person. Also, they may have underlying hypertension, so they may live around 180 over 95. So again, this in, in a patient like that who normally lives at that range, 120 over 80, that's patient, this patient is in shock. And, and that may be the case with the, the, uh, the patient that I presented a few minutes ago. Respiratory system. The chest wall is fixed and rigid in an elderly patient. Uh, there's decreased chest wall compliance, decreased strength of the intercostal muscles, decreased strength of the diaphragm. They have a decreased cough reflex, which predisposes to pneumonia, aspiration, uh, and their overall alveolar surface area is decreased, and that interferes with gas exchange. All of these things together predispose to several complications that they can have from just a few rib fractures. This particular slide shows the pulmonary contusion. It's usually an isolated uh, opacity in the chest. Other complications that can occur from a severe chest injury are, uh, uh, like I said, severe pulmonary contusion. And the reason they get a pulmonary contusion is because the ribs fracture easily so they don't take a lot of the impact. So the impact is taken up by the lung itself. On a younger healthy person, the impact is absorbed by the ribs, less risk of lung injury. Okay. So they're, they're at risk for aspiration pneumonia uh, and uh, ventilator dependency and ARDS. This is uh, a classic ARDS, fluffy, bilateral, equal white infiltrates. <clears throat> so don't underestimate rib fractures. Again, a lot of us, you know, somebody comes in with a rib fracture, you say, okay, put them up on the floor, I'll see them later. Um, give them some pain medicine, anticipate discharge them home in a couple days. That's fine for a younger person. For an older person, this, this first slot, uh, statement here, this is based on a large multi-center retrospective study that uh, showed that patients with multiple rib fractures over the age of uh, 65 have a 19% increase in mortality for each rib fracture. So if you do the math, you have five or six rib fractures, it's 100% mortality. So you cannot underestimate rib fractures in an elderly patient. Most of these patients need to be admitted to the intensive care unit. Now, you're an ICU nurse, you're busy, you've got you know, somebody here over here on drip, somebody over here is bleeding to death, somebody over here who's got a myocardial infarction, and they tell you you're gonna have a patient who has rib fractures. Well, it doesn't sound exciting, and it sounds like it's gonna increase the work of your day for no reason, but these patients can crump in the middle of the night. So they need to be monitored carefully, their O2 sats, their vital signs, significant pulmonary toilet, they need to be monitored for arrhythmias. So when we put a patient in the ICU who's got four or five rib fractures and they're 75 years old, there's a reason for it. Because they, they can deteriorate rapidly. The initial chest x-ray when you come in does not always reflect what's going on in the chest two, three hours later. So they can develop significant pulmonary contusion especially if they're on a blood thinner, they ble can bleed into the lung, and significant uh, pulmonary edema or ARDS just overnight. And then the next chest x-ray the next morning looks much, much worse. So that's why they need to be observed. <clears throat> Central nervous system, the brain atrophies as we age. At age 70, the brain is decreased in size about 10%. So this is a normal brain, normal, young, healthy brain. This is kind of an extreme example, but I just want you to understand this is an example of cerebral atrophy. The, the uh, gray and white matter decrease, the ventricles enlarge, and the brain shrinks and pulls away from the skull, and that puts tension on the subdural veins. So the subdural veins tear easily because the brain is very mobile. Normally it's fairly fixed in the skull if you get in a car accident. But if the brain is smaller and you, and you have an injury where you impact your brain, the brain is really sloshing around in your skull and it tears the subdural veins and that's how we get a subdural hematoma. 
Again, this is a subdural hematoma. Um, we, have to, we have to suspect that a patient has this, even with a minor injury, uh, especially if they have any alteration in their Glasgow coma scale. 12, 13, even 14, any neurologic uh, you know, deficits, um, any bruising around the eyes or around the back of the ear, that's raccoon sign and battle sign, um, any, you know, uh, any suspicion at all that they have a head injury, have a very, very low threshold for a CT scan, especially if they've lost consciousness. And that's, they don't have to lose consciousness to get a CT scan. They can be completely awake and alert and still have an expanding subdural hematoma. It may not present itself right away because the brain is smaller, there's more room for the blood to accumulate, so the blood can be collecting in their brain and they're not showing any signs of herniation yet because there's more space in their brain, around their brain. So these are some underlying diseases and disorders that they come in with that can make your assessment more difficult. If you're trying to assess somebody for possible subdural hematoma and they have dementia or cerebrovascular disease, it's going to be more difficult to get an exam. So you have to, it's very important to get a good history when they hit the door. Ideally, hopefully family is there so you can get a history from them. Dementia, carotid artery disease, decreased reflexes, peripheral neuropathy, impaired balance, uh, and visual and auditory problems. All of these things interfere with their ability to recover from a possible fall. They, they lose their balance. They can't write themselves up before they hit the ground. And all of these things interfere with their recovery as well. If they have to have a craniotomy or any operation or even observation for rib fractures, if they have these problems already, it's going to be a much harder recovery. That's why we need to get physical therapy involved very, very quickly. Also, these patients have osteoarthritis of their spine and, are, and many elderly patients have cervical stenosis. That's a a narrowing of the cervical spine, which makes a very tight space around the spinal cord. If they fall, it may seem like a very minor injury. Fell in the kitchen, um, maybe have a little bruising on their face, they can, they can have a spinal cord injury because they have underlying spinal stenosis. Whereas a younger person has a lot more room around their spinal cord, an uh, elderly patient can have a, a fracture, and maybe not even a fracture, just a spinal cord contusion can cause severe life-threatening uh, or debilitating spinal cord injury. So it's very important to maintain their cervical spine in a neutral position, the cervical collar, and get a, uh, when you intubate the patient, you have to maintain, and we do this on all trauma patients, but on an elderly patient in particular, just a slight amount of movement when you intubate the patient can, can turn a minor spinal cord injury into a, a severe spinal cord complete injury. So spinal cord precautions on all trauma patients until their C-spine is cleared. So kidney disease, renal impairment, they have a decreased uh, glomerular filtration rate. Uh, many patients have renal artery stenosis. And because of that, they're at increased risk after they're admitted to the hospital for electrolyte imbalances, volume overload, and impaired clearance of drugs that they come in on and drugs that we give them. Uh, and because of the renal impairment, urine output, is, uh, as far as an endpoint of resuscitation, is not as reliable. So you know, I always tell my residents and students, you know, one of the best ways to, to know if a patient is perfusing their organs, if they're not in shock, is urine output. And also capillary refill and their mental status. Are they perfusing their brain? Are they perfusing their skin? Are they perfusing their kidneys? Those are quick and easy ways to see if somebody is in shock or not. So an elderly patient, we already know, they may have dementia. So, so their uh, neurologic exam may be impaired. Same with the renal impairment. Um, you can't rely on <coughs> urinary output as, as an endpoint of resuscitation, okay? So uh, we all glance at the creatinine and get a good feeling if it's 1.3. You know, I do it myself. Um, and I don't, I, I've got to admit, I don't calculate their creatinine clearance enough. But for an elderly patient, just looking at the creatinine is not enough. Uh, pharmacists do this a lot, um, and we have to know what their creatinine clearance is to decide if they're in renal failure or not, to decide what kind of drugs we can give them, how much fluid to give them. So this is the equation, um, and uh, it's just a very important thing to keep in mind. Secondary, we can, we can injure the brain, secondary injury to the brain by giving patients too much fluid. Uh, we can also um, 
injure their kidneys after the injury, secondary renal injury, by ignoring things or by doing things that can impair their kidneys further. So after the patient is admitted, we need to avoid hypotension. If we don't perfuse the kidneys, they can go into renal failure. The, everybody, you know, everybody gets a CAT scan when they hit the door. You don't, need a, you don't need contrast for a CT of the brain, but to appropriately evaluate the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, you, you really need IV contrast. And you have to decide, is, am I concerned enough about this patient's chest or abdomen to give them IV contrast? Because if they have renal disease, you can put them into renal failure by giving them IV dye. So, is, you have to decide, is a chest x-ray enough to evaluate this patient? No contrast. Or do I need to CT scan their chest? Do I think they have a transected aorta or a major vascular injury? And for abdominal exam, is my abdominal exam good enough? Is the FAST exam good enough? That's an ultrasound exam of the abdomen. No contrast there. Or am I really concerned that they have a major liver injury or spleen injury? Then I, I do need to use contrast. And then you, you have to risk putting the patient into renal failure. Many of the medications we give patients uh, can damage their kidneys, genomycin, some diuretics, and vasopressors are probably the worst thing you can do for uh, impaired renal function. Uh, fortunately, we try to avoid vasopressors in trauma. Trauma uh, uh, shock is treated by surgical control of bleeding and fluids and blood. Vasopressors are a very, very last resort, but if you have to use them, and you use them in an elderly patient with renal disease, you might as well call uh, the nephrologist because they're probably going to need dialysis. That's why it's so important to get, get control of the bleeding, get blood and fluids in uh, early on. Gastrointestinal system, the main point here is that elderly patients don't always respond to an exam when they have peritonitis or an injury. Um, sometimes I'll get called on a patient who, uh, on the floor, who, who might have uh, metabolic acidosis, elevated white count, uh, but they don't have much belly pain. And on exam, they don't, they're really not hurting that badly. But sure enough, you get an x-ray and they've got free air everywhere. They've perforated an ulcer. So, and, and this has to do with their neurologic, uh, you know, uh, system in their, and around their intestines and their peritoneum. They don't always respond to uh, peritonitis. So you can examine a patient's abdomen in the ER, especially if they have neurologic disease or distracting injuries like a femur fracture. Uh, they may be bleeding in their abdomen and you press on their belly and it may be a normal exam. So that's why FAST exam is so, everybody know what FAST exam is? Ultrasound exam for trauma? That's why FAST exam is so important. We have an ultrasound in the ER. You have a question or you don't? You don't? FAST exam, uh, is focused assessments uh, uh, for uh, uh, ultrasound for trauma, <coughs> sonography for trauma. And basically what it is, it's a, it's a portable ultrasound machine that you place on the patient's abdomen and you, it tells you if there's blood in their abdomen, blood or fluid. Um, and that's basically all it can tell you. It can't tell you if they have a definite spleen injury or a definite liver injury, but it tells you if they have blood in their abdomen. And if they have blood in their abdomen, if they're hypotensive, that's usually enough information to take them straight to the operating room. If they have blood in their abdomen and they're not hypotensive, then you usually take them for a CT scan and see what is bleeding. But it's, it can be done just in a few minutes at the bedside. It can be repeated, so we, we can do an ultrasound. If it looks okay initially and then the patient drops their pressure half hour later, we can pull the ultrasound machine over, do another ultrasound and see is there, now are they accumulating blood in their abdomen. So that's very, very important in an elderly patient especially because we don't want to give them contrast unless we absolutely have to. Some patients, just a caveat with FAST exam, if patients have ascites or if they're on peritoneal dialysis, they're going to have fluid in their abdomen already. So you, you want to know that up front so you don't think it's blood in their abdomen. So the metabolism of an elderly patient is also impaired. Their thyroid and thymus glands fibrose and don't function well. Um, they have decreased T cell immunity and decreased, uh, decreased T cells in general. Uh, glucose intolerance and malnutrition. All of these problems are very, very common in the elderly. All of these problems predispose to infection. So if they have traumatic wounds, if they have a perforated viscous, if they are predisposed to pneumonia, this can get out of control very quickly. So, um, it's important to address contaminated wounds early and, and get them on appropriate antibiotics early as well. And that's a T cell. Integumentary system, their skin. As, as we age, our skin atrophies, becomes very thin. 
uh, there's decreased water content in cells, decreased subcutaneous fat, and there is increased risk of hypothermia because our skin, you know, <laughs> kind of keeps us warm and the, and the subcutaneous fat keeps us warm. And, and it predisposes them to decubitus ulcer. So uh, we, number one, we need to get these patients off the backboard as soon as possible. Uh, years and years ago, we used to keep the patient, we were so obsessed with C-spine injuries and thoracic spine injuries that we kept patients on the backboards way too long to protect those injuries. Now we know that we can protect the C-spine by log rolling the patient, paying attention to their posture in bed. We want to get them off the backboard as soon as possible, especially an elderly patient. They can break down in less than an hour, okay? So musculoskeletal system, uh, as we age, we get osteoporosis, decreased muscle mass, and increased risk of fractures. And these are the five most common fractures in an elderly patient, ribs, proximal femur, hip, humerus, and wrist. Uh, fractures are the number one cause of morbidity, not mortality, but morbidity. Uh, patients spend a long time in the hospital, they go to rehab, they're there for several weeks. Uh, and recovering from their from their fractures and this this puts a real toll on the patient on their family and on the financial system and many of these most of these occur just from a fall so um, there needs to be a lot of uh, attention based on prevention uh, you know to prevent some of these uh, very severe injuries that normally on a young person you get it fixed you go home a couple days later you're fine so we we need to we need to know as much as we can about these patients when they, when they come into the hospital. And they may be on medications that interfere with their assessment. So beta blockers, everybody knows what a beta blocker is, I'm sure, it slows down the heart rate, okay? If somebody's on a beta blocker, they may not respond the way a normal, a younger person or a person on no medication would respond to trauma with tachycardia. That's the first thing we look at. When, when, a, when a trauma patient comes to the to the uh, ER, the first thing I look at after I look at them is their heart rate. Because the heart rate is gonna tell you before anything else is this patient, is it looks like they're gonna become, starting to be in shock. So an elderly patient may have a heart rate of 60 or 70, but they're in shock. The beta blocker is not letting them respond. The beta blocker and the fact that they don't respond to their own catecholamines that are going through their body, okay? So don't be fooled by a heart rate of 70 in an elderly patient. Calcium channel blockers can prevent peripheral vasoconstriction, uh, which is another mechanism to help maintain our blood pressure, so that can contribute to hypotension. Uh, I hate these medications. Um, most, most surgeons do, most trauma surgeons do. Coumadin, Plavix, Zeralto, Pradaxa, non-steroidals, not, not as big of a deal as the rest of them, and Eliquis. Somebody is on these medications when they come in, and sometimes somebody's on Coumadin, they're not compliant with their lab data, they may come in with an INR of five. An INR of five plus a subdural hematoma is pretty much a death sentence or, or close to it. I mean, these patients are gonna be severely impaired, have a significantly high morbidity and mortality, and they need to be taken to the emergency operating room immediately for decompression, and they still, many of them, do not do well. So this is, you know, anytime you put a patient on these medications, you have to have the talk with them. Yes, we're gonna treat your atrial fibrillation or your blood clot or your, or your coronary disease, but if you fall, you can die. And, and patients die from falls if they're on these medications. So it's important to know, that's why family is so important, that's why hopefully, you know, one of the, one of the benefits of EMR, we all hate EMR, but if their medications are, are in the EMR already, you know, uh, we don't have to rifle through their purse to see what medications they're, are, they're on. We need to know if they're on these medications as soon as possible. Coumadin can be reversed with FFP and vitamin K. M most of these other medications, there is no reversal. You can give platelets and platelets and platelets and FFP, and as long as this me these medications are in their system, the, the, those coagulation uh, factors may not uh, reverse. So. Um, this has really put it, made trauma care challenging in the last 10 years or so. Other medications that can interfere with trauma care, steroids, uh, decrease your immune system, which predisposes to infection. Diuretics, predisposed to hypovolemia and electrolyte abnormalities, so they may, they may hit the door with electrolyte, electrolyte abnormalities. And psychotropic medications, um, benzodiazepines, antidepressants, things like that, that can alter their mental status. That may have even contributed to the fall or car accident. Uh, 
Uh, and then we have to decide after they're admitted, do we need to continue these medications? Uh, you know, because that may interfere with their recovery as well. So some accessories that, try, that elderly patients might come in with. Pacemakers, um, you should, you know, you, sh you should be able to see a pacemaker uh, indentation uh, on exam and a chest x-ray would definitely show one. That can prevent tachycardia. So if a patient's in shock, they might have a heart rate of 70 or 80 because of their pacemaker. Uh, hearing aids, you know, if you're, if you're talking to a patient, a lot of patients have hearing problems anyway, but if their hearing aid might have fallen out in the car accident and you're talking to them and they're just staring at you and not responding, it might be because they can't hear you. So you can't, you have to try and decide is they just, they can't hear me or do they have a low Glasgow coma scale. Um, they may or may not have glasses, so if you do a vision test, you have to, you know, try and figure out, you know, they really can't see me or they just lost their glasses. And dentures can prevent a challenge. You can aspirate dentures. If they break especially, they can be a challenge to intubate a patient with dentures as well. Uh, so these are just things to kind of keep in the back of your mind. These aren't as important as some of the other things we talked about, but just things that we deal with occasionally. Uh, depression and suicide rate is extremely high in the elderly. Um, the, the, the rates of suicide are five times higher in the elderly popula uh, population as in the general population. They also have the greatest success rate. So one in four will be successful at suicide as opposed to one in 25. And they are very serious about this uh, endeavor because most of them use firearms as opposed to drugs, hanging, things like that. So uh, this is something that we have to be aware of. And um, this is just kind of a statistic, but it's a very sad statistic. Elder abuse is something that we always have to keep in the back of our mind. Um, I, I have to remind myself of it, uh, you know, uh, also, I don't always think about this, to be honest. Um, you know, if a patient comes in from a nursing home and the history is they fell and nobody witnessed it and there's no family there, it's possible they might have been abused. Um, the, the abuse goes on in nursing homes and, and, uh, and we, we, we really have to be aware of that, okay? Uh, about two million are abused a year, only five in, out of six are go unreported and it can be physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse, and neglect. And so similar to, you know, we always think of children uh, being abused and we all have in our heads, what do we look for? You know, we've all been taught several times what to look for in a child. It's similar for an elderly patient. Um, bruises in various stages of healing. The mechanism really doesn't coincide with the injuries that you see. Uh, clumps of hair that are missing. Uh, abrasions from restraints, especially if somebody's in a nursing home and, and the caregiver just doesn't want to deal with them and they just tie them down to the bed. Uh, and <coughs> bruises on the inner arms or inner thighs, and also uh, isolated burns. If a patient's in a nursing home, usually they're not allowed to have anything that could burn them, but if they have burn injuries, you have to be suspicious that it's abuse. And if you, if you suspect abuse, you have to report it. So, how do we improve the care of, uh, trauma care of the elderly patient? So we're gonna break this down into pre-hospital management first. Pre-hospital management, EMS providers have to be aware that even a minor trauma in an elderly patient can be a life-threatening uh, injury. Um, so how do you determine if somebody is really, really sick or injured in the field? Um, the, you know, this has been researched and looked at you know, m multiple times. They looked at Apache score, injury severity score, and, and what they have determined is that the best uh, way to, de to decide if somebody is severely injured in the field and should be a transported trauma center is called the trauma score. And it's very simple. It's the respiratory rate, systolic blood pressure, keeping in mind that their blood pressure may not reflect that they're in shock, but that's, that's on, the, on the list. Capillary refill is a very simple, easy thing that you can do to, to see if somebody's perfusing their skin. And Glasgow Coma Scale. So if they're breathing, breathing fast, if they're confused and not responding, if they don't have capillary refill, go to the emergency room. In 2006, the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma recommends that all patients over the age of 55 be transported to a trauma center regardless of their mechanism or apparent severity. Now that sounds, if you're a ER doctor, you're thinking, why am I evaluating all these falls on 55-year-olds? But it's been shown that minor trauma can cause a severe injury. When they get to the emergency room, we have to keep in mind that many, many elderly patients are mistriaged. <laughs> 
Again, it usually has to do with their mechanism, and they may not be tachycardic or hypotensive, like we talked about. Um, one large multi, uh, multi-institution study uh, showed that, uh, this is a retrospective study, showed that 49%, almost half of elderly patients, are mistriaged. The principles of the ABCs are the same as in a young person, with the exception of you just have to understand that the physiology for an elderly patient is different. So, for example, with airway, cervical stenosis, more common in an elderly patient, you have to be more careful when you intubate them. The, the tissue on the inside of their nares is thinner and may bleed easier. If you're going to put an NG tube in, you have to be aware of dentures, things like that. Uh, breathing, listen to their lungs, feel their chest, just like you would anybody else, but you have to be aware, again, that the chest is a fixed, rigid structure, higher risk for immediate respiratory failure in an elderly patient, but you examine them and assess them the same way. Uh, C, circulation. Uh, you have to realize that they may not have good peripheral pulses because they've got peripheral artery disease, not because they're in shock. They may have calcified arteries. They may not have pedal pulses to begin with before the injury. So you just have to remember the adult physiology and correlate that with your exam. But we basically do the ABCs same, same way all the way through. Uh, remember that their vital signs may be unreliable. Don't be reassured by normal vital signs in an elderly patient. Take them off the backboard as, backboard as soon as possible and take a good history. Um, if a young person who's wide awake comes in, we, you know, we all get very busy, we go through the history very quickly. Do you have coronary artery disease, diabetes, hypertension, asthma? You just run through it and they, no, 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 and you can get through it pretty quickly. With an elderly person, especially with underlying maybe dementia, uh, um, you have to be patient. And I, I, I have to remind myself you know, frequently, slow down, ask them a question, get an answer, move on to the next question. And you, we can't get frustrated if they can't come up with the answer right away. I know it can be frustrating and you've got a lot of things going on, you want to get this patient to the CAT scanner, but it's very important to get a good history early because if they deteriorate and if there's no family there, you know nothing about this patient. So you want to know, and you want to know what happened bef ideally before the accident, what caused the accident. We'll get to that some more here in a second. So when they hit the hospital, we've admitted the patient. We need to protect the patient, okay? They might have fallen at home. We don't want them to fall here. So we have to protect them, and you're, I'm sure all, most of you are nurses. You know how to protect the patient uh, and, and prevent falls. Uh, avoid over-sedation. Sometimes patients get a little confused at night or get agitated. You don't want to just throw Ativan at them and, and put them to bed and give them Ativan. Ideally, you need to assess the patient. We'll go over that some more here in a second. Avoid overhydration and underhydration. You really have to, to pay attention to their eyes and nose and their electrolytes. Inquire about living will early on because once they're on a ventilator and if there's no family there and there's no documentation before they hit the door, then your decision making is going to be much more difficult. Involve social services as soon as they get admitted. I'm, I, I'm, I don't do that, I gotta admit, I don't do this all the time, I'm getting better at it, but this is so, so important as far as um, their rehab and their recovery. Um, you have to address the comorbid conditions if they're on a beta blocker, for instance. Ideally, you want to continue that in the hospital so they don't get rebound tachycardia. If they have diabetes, you've got to pay attention to their blood sugar. We can't just ignore all of those things because, you know, they're bleeding to death. You take care of the bleeding first, then we have to address these things. And then don't, con uh, don't assume confusion is just sundowning or ICU psychosis. If a patient has a change, a trauma patient has a change in their mental status, the number one thing we have to rule out is an expanding hematoma, cerebral edema, worsening or secondary brain injury. And so we need to take them back to the CT scan to see if that is happening. A lot of patients who have an initial head injury will automatically get a CT scan the next day anyway as part of their neurologic assessment. But if they have a change in their Glasgow coma scale, number one thing is expanding hematoma, cerebral edema, secondary brain injury. Uh, next thing on the list is hypoxia, okay? That can cause um, uh, change in mental status. So make sure their pulse oximetry is okay, make sure they're on appropriate oxygen, good capillary refill. Uh, this could be a reaction to medications that, that they came in on or that we're giving them, and hypotension also causes change in mental status. And only after you go through all of these things and rule out medical causes, then possibly ICU psychosis or just agitation, anxiety. We have to be aware that a medical event may have caused their trauma. They might not just have slipped on a rug. They might have had a heart attack and fallen. Uh, 
okay? Uh, arrhythmias, stroke, TIA, an episode of hypotension for whatever reason, just some dehydration or diarrhea possibly can cause hypotension and they fall. And hypoglycemia. So um, that's why it's so important to get a good history and we have, to, we have to have these things in the back of our mind all the time because if I admit a trauma patient and I, and I don't consider that an MI might have caused their fall, they're gonna die, okay? If I don't call a cardiologist to, to assess them. So this is very important for, for to get a good history and, and to ideally have a, a witness, if somebody witnessed it or a family member, and, um, so that we can address these things after they get admitted. So um, we've taken care of the patient, they're getting ready to go home or go to rehab, what are the things that we need to think about? Again, social services need to be consulted early. We, ha we really need to get, I need to get better at this, we all need to get better. I know you guys address this a lot with patients, but their home living conditions. Was it a poor rug that caused the fall? Was it, was it poor lighting on the stairs? Was it no hand railing on the stairs? Was it an unsafe tub or shower? Uh, so that's why we need to get social services involved and we need to try and get what the patients need at home so this doesn't happen again, okay? We need to make sure they have appropriate follow-up to treat osteoporosis or other uh, medical issues that may be contributing to their falls or fractures. Um, you know, do they have appropriate eyewear? Do they have appropriate hearing aids? Um, do they have a cane or a walker? Uh, so we, so we and this, these things sound kind of boring and nursing home kind of things, but these are so important to prevent these injuries from happening again. And always consider assisted living if it's appropriate for the patient. We don't want to just, if they can go home, that's the best thing for them. <clears throat> if they can go home with family, fantastic. But some people, some patients need to go to a nursing home or assisted living, and so that should be addressed. So, <clears throat> back to our case scenario. This is our patient who was transferred to the green pod. So was he triaged appropriately or not? No, no, he should be in the red pod. Um, his vital signs fooled us, right? He's on a beta blocker, his heart rate's 64. He's not responding to catecholamine. So his vital signs look okay. You think, ah, put him in green pod. This patient's in shock from his spleen injury, okay? Uh, respiratory rate, yeah, something's going on. So that should have tipped us off that the patient uh, has something going on in their chest, and he does. Rib fractures and a pulmonary contusion. Glasgow coma scale is abnormal. So he did have a subdural hematoma, okay? So don't be fooled by vital signs. So again, uh, rib fractures can cause a pulmonary contusion. These patients can easily end up on a ventilator. So again, don't underestimate, uh, don't underestimate a uh, rib fracture. Uh, pelvis fracture, he, this patient would be splinted. Nothing needs to occur immediately for this fracture other than an orthopedic consult and take care of their major injuries first and address this later. CT scan of the brain uh, shows a subdural hematoma. This needs to be evacuated immediately. And a spleen injury. Now some spleen injuries we watch <clears throat> in the ICU. Some spleen injuries we have to operate on. And that's a judgment call based on their vital signs, their abdominal exam, and the findings on the CT scan. So let's, I just want to just see, show of hands. Let's say this patient, I feel this patient is bleeding into their abdomen for their, from their spleen injury, and they have a subdural hematoma with a shift. Which one is the most, which one requires the most immediate attention? So who thinks the spleen injury requires more immediate retention than the brain? Okay, who thinks the brain requires more immediate attention than the spleen? Okay. All right, so this is, this is actually a board question on the surgery boards, and we get asked this over and over again. This is debated in, in uh, trauma conferences, but if somebody is in shock, if somebody is bleeding, and they're bleeding in their abdomen, and they're bleeding into their brain, the top priority is almost always their abdomen, and the reason is because they can bleed to death from their spleen injury. They're not gonna bleed to death from their brain injury because the brain is a closed unit. They, can, they might herniate, but they're not gonna bleed to death. So the first thing we have to stop is bleeding. So they can, their belly can swell up, they can lose three to four liters of blood in their abdomen, especially if they're on a blood thinner. So the way we would handle this patient is we would take them to the operating room, let's say Dr. Sweeney and I, take them to the operating room, I would open their abdomen, get the spleen out in five minutes. And then he would do the craniotomy. So they're kinda happening at the same time. Um, both are emergency situations. There's no question about it. I'm not trying to downplay the, the brain injury. But uh, if someone is bleeding in their abdomen, there is no tamponade in the abdomen. They will bleed to death, their belly will swell and swell until they bleed to death, okay? Um, 
So all of these injuries are serious. Any one of these injuries could have caused this patient's death. Even the rib fractures and pulmonary contusion in an elderly patient can cause this patient's death. The hip fracture, they're gonna be laying in bed, they might get a bed sore, um, they could get a deep vein thrombosis. So you know, all of these are serious in and of themselves. All of them combined together, uh, this patient has a very, very high mortality rate. Okay, so in summary, <clears throat> These are the take-home messages, okay? Uh, anatomic and physiologic changes in the elderly are associated with increased morbidity and mortality. We have to remember all of these things about the cardiovascular system, renal, pulmonary system, so that we can, we can use those to have those in our, in our minds when we're taking care of elderly patients. Don't be fooled by normal vital signs, okay? Uh, this patient, patients with normal vital signs could be in shock. And a seemingly minor trauma can cause a life-threatening injury. So don't just put somebody in green pod uh, and, and, uh, and kind of ignore them. These patients, even with a fall or minor injury, can have a severe subdural hematoma, intra-abdominal injury, or chest injury. Anybody have any questions? Somebody's got to have a question. All right, there we go. This is not trauma related, but are we doing fall assessments, fall assessments in the in the primary practice for people 65 and older? Are primary Should, care doctors doing that? Yeah. Are they Honestly, doing I don't know. Does anybody? I really else don't know. know. Does that mean? Do you mean are they assessing the risk for exactly. fall at home? Exactly. I would hope so. I would I would think that they should be, but I really don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Okay. All right. Thanks. A good family doctor will definitely do that. I'm sure. But it's, it's important for us to, you know, they come to us, unfortunately, after the incident, after the accident, we have to address it. But it, that's why it's so important for us to address those things before they go home. And ideally, if they have family who can help and tell us what things are like at home or tell us what their living conditions are. So we have to kind of be the primary caregivers before they go home. You know, we, we, we treat them from their injuries, we get them over, out of the shock, we, we rehab them. But before they hit the door, we're kind of a family doctor. We've got to make sure they have all these. Even if we just call the family doctor and say, hey, this lady, she's fallen at home. She has osteoporosis. She can't see well. She's got bad glasses. Do you mind taking care of these issues? You know, not to dump that on the family doctor, but you know, we, you know, if we can't take care of these issues, it has to be taken care of by somebody. So that's why it's so important for appropriate follow-up. Yes? I think also the importance of home care or sometimes you have the occupational I think it's a great point. Yeah, I, I think we're doing home PT more and more, and I think that's a great way to assess a patient's home, especially if they don't have family, because they really can't tell you. They can't describe what's going on at home. Right. Anybody else? Okay. Thanks for coming. Have a great morning. Have a great day.